Hey, good afternoon, and welcome to our cross-connection control and backflow prevention webinar. We're joined by Cameron Rappaport, our backflow product specialist. During the duration of today's presentation, phone lines will be muted, but we encourage you to submit questions via the, via the chat window. Just hover over the chat icon at the bottom of the WebEx and type in your question. We'll then address them after the presentation. So with that, let me pass it off to Cameron and get started. All right, welcome everyone. As Greg said, my name is Cameron Rappaport and I am the Backflow Product Specialist here at Watts. To give you some background on myself, I've been here at Watts for about two years. Uh, I've been working on everything from new product development to marketing material to training such as this one, all around Backflow. So prior to my experience at Watts, I worked in fluid sealing for process industry, so I've been a pump and a valve guy for a while now. Some things to note uh, to make sure we get all of the CEU stuff covered. This course is for ASB CEUs only, so it is not necessarily approved uh, for professional development hours for your PE certification. Uh, certified in plumbing design or certified plumbing design technicians can use this course towards their recertification, and it may or may not be accepted for PE renewal. You'll have to inquire with your state to determine if you can get this to count towards maintaining that. So on to the content. So today we're hoping that by the end you will understand the importance of the backflow preventer to the protection and conservation of safe drinking water, describe cross-connection control programs and their importance to total backflow prevention, understand the backflow preventer selection criteria and how they work, understand the typical faults and failures associated with backflow preventers, and finally, understand the typical troubleshooting and maintenance solutions for backflow preventers. So that's a lot. We're going to go quick. If you need anything, like Greg said, throw it in the chat bar. We'll get to all those questions at the end. So first, let's define some terms. In order for contaminants to get into the water distribution system as a result of backflow, you need three things, a cross connection, a source of contamination, and a backflow event. So let's break down that first thing, a cross connection. So a cross connection, as defined by the EPA, is any actual or potential connection between the public water supply and a source of contamination or pollution. These cross connections constitute a hazard to the building occupants and they can jeopardize the cleanliness and potability of the public water system in the event of a backflow or back siphonage event. So what's the difference between an actual and a potential connection? An actual connection is a direct connection to a source of contamination. A good example in this image, you see my cursor, is this boiler. The water in your hydronic heating system is considered non-potable and you have a boiler feed water makeup line directly connected to it. A potential connection is something like this hose that I'm indicating on the outside of the house. It's not typically connected to a source of contamination, but it could be at any time. For example, you could connect it directly to a pesticide sprayer. So that's an indirect connection or a potential connection. So backflow, what we're here to talk about. Backflow is the unwanted reverse flow of a liquid, gas, or other substance into a potable water distribution system. Our potable water distribution system is built to operate primarily in one direction. It's going from the source right to the point of use out of your taps. When that direction reverses and you have cross connections downstream, you risk introducing contaminants. In this case, we have a water main break. When the water main breaks, there's potential to siphon any number of contaminants. You have dirty water, in your bathtub and your sink, if you have a sprayer hose submerged in there, you have stagnant water and perhaps glycol here in your boiler system, you have stagnant pools or fertilizer or other kind of chemicals in your irrigation system, all of those could end up mixing with the water that's meant to drink. So, Within backflow, there's a couple different kinds. The first kind is back siphonage. So back siphonage condition occurs when you get negative or sub-atmospheric pressure in the distribution piping of the potable water system. This typically occurs on periods of very high demand in the public water main, which will lower that supply pressure. So it has to be a very high demand 
to get it negative or subatmospheric. So we're looking at things like firefighting events or water main breaks, which are suddenly and significantly going to lower that city water pressure below that of your non-potable system. So this will result in a partial vacuum being drawn on the non-potable system, which will siphon the pollutants or contaminants into the potable water system through an unprotected cross connection. In this case, we have a hose bib in a pool. So we don't know what's in that pool water. We don't want to be drinking it. We have whatever is in your boiler. Like we said before, if you have unprotected sprayer hoses that are submerged in your bath, maybe you're giving a flea bath, all of those without adequate protection are going to siphon out and into the drinking water system. So you can think of back siphonage as a pull from the supply side, which leads to our next term, back pressure. Back pressure is a push from the downstream side. So back pressure condition occurs when there's an elevated pressure between the potable and the non-potable source. This can be caused by the installation of pumps, which increase pressures above city water supply pressure, which will force non-potable water in the opposite direction of normal flow and into the potable water line. Also, boilers or other equipment with heat, which heat water cause thermal expansion, which results in pressures that can get in excess of the incoming water pressure, can also force non-potable water into your potable piping system. So here we have a boiler on the left. It's inactive, your water is cold, but once it heats up, that water is gonna to want to expand, its pressure is gonna increase, and without backflow preventers, it's gonna migrate over into your potable water system. So I'm gonna go through some common terms very quickly just so we're all speaking the same language. So pressure is typically measured in pounds per square inch, PSI or bars is force per unit area. For our uses, we'll talk in either gauge pressure, which uses atmospheric pressure is zero, but we are gonna be talking a lot about differential pressure. Flow rate and velocity are both measurements of flow with rate being the amount of flow, uh, fluid flowing per unit time. So gallons per minute, cubic feet per minute. Velocity is the speed of that flow measured in feet per second. So here we have a flow curve. So these are typically published as part of your engineering sheets, your specification sheets with a backflow preventer. This shows pressure drop due to friction loss across a device as a function of flow rate or flow velocity. In this case, this is a double check valve assembly. This can be thought of as the performance of the valve and it typically goes from zero to 25 feet per second. So service flow, you'll notice there are several different indications right here. Service flow is typically determined by a velocity, so seven and a half feet per second based on a schedule 40 pipe. To use a car analogy, which I like using, this is an average speed where you're gonna limit the wear and tear on your vehicle, you're gonna get good mileage, say 50 miles an hour. We also have rated flow. Rated flow identifies maximum continuous duty performance. Oop. That's gonna be determined by the AWWA. So for typical services, you do not want to exceed this flow rate or you will increase wear and tear on the device. So to continue my car analogy, this is the red line on your speedometer. You can operate just below the red line every day, but you're going to experience increased wear and tear and you don't necessarily be want, want to be sitting there all the time, but occasionally you can get up there. We also have UL rated flow. UL rated is 150% of rated flow and it is not recommended for continuous duty. So this is typically only used for fire systems where you should either have no flow or in case of a fire, extremely high flow. So in this analogy, now you're drag racing. Not something you should do with your car every day, which is why we really just reserve this for fire suppression systems. Also notice over here on the right-hand side an N, H, and V. So these correspond to the three different curves that are graphed out here. And these are different orientations for a backflow preventer. In this case, this double check valve assemblies, you can have it in an N pattern, that is a flow up across and down, a horizontal installation, so flow, say, left to right, or a vertical installation, say flow bottom to top. 
those are all going to have slightly different characteristics. So what are the key elements of a cross-connection control program? The first is isolation. Isolation protects any cross-connection which exists within the owner's premises through the use of appropriate backflow prevention devices. So it's going to isolate any hazard to that particular location, and it's going to protect the remainder of that owner's potable water system from contamination. So isolation protects you from the hazards within your own building or property. This is typically governed by universal plumbing code or international plumbing code. So what is containment? Containment is the containment of a pro property's private water system from the city's drinking water supply system. So it's separating your system from the water main. This is done downstream of a property's water service connection, the water meter, and is achieved by installing a backfill prevention device typically immediately after the water meter. It's going to be that first device right after the meter. So containment is for when the water purveyor gives you water, they don't want it back because they do not know what you did to it. So it's protecting you from your neighbors and vice versa. So total backflow protection combines isolation, which protects you from the hazards within your own building or property, and containment, which protects you from the hazards from other buildings. And that's going to assure that you have safe drinking water from the point of treatment all the way to the point of use. We do have a little mnemonic device, and this is going to remind us of all the key elements of a cross-connection control program, which protects public water. It's the ABCs. So A is authority, it is the legal basis to implement a policy and enforce it. Typically, people don't install backflow preventers unless they are mandated to. Uh, and if they're mandated to, they might not do it unless they face fines or cessation of service if they don't comply. So having that authority and legal basis is very important. B is backflow preventers. You need approved and appropriate devices to prevent backflow. C is certified testers and specialists. These are the people who will test and inspect the devices in cross connections and then administer the program. D is defensible and detailed records or documentation. So this documents your policies, your procedures, your code requirements, your site surveys, your test record, records. And this is going to be vital to enforcing that backflow program. And finally, E is education and training, just like we're doing today. This includes both the education of plumbing professionals, such as yourself, and also the general public to make sure they're aware of the importance of cross-connection control and backflow prevention. And this is courtesy of USC FCCCHR, which we'll get to. So where are all of these cross-connections? Well, they're extremely common, and they all require appropriate backflow protection. So here we have three different buildings, a couple commercial buildings and a residence. They have containment devices right, right at their entries, connections to the water mains. You'll notice these actually have three different containment devices, which is important. We'll talk about that later. In addition, they also have isolation protection at all of these different points of use. You have your sinks, vending machines, laundry, boiler, sprinkler systems hose bibs. So these are very, very ubiquitous. Cross connections are all over the place, which is why we need lots of different kinds of backflow preventers. So how do we choose which backflow preventer is appropriate for a given application? One important factor is degree of hazard. So when we talk about this bottom one, pollutants or non-health hazards. A pollutant is any substance which may affect the color, taste, or odor of potable water, but which does not pose a direct threat to human health through exposure or consumption of that water. So pollutants may impose an objectionable odor or appearance, but, not, but do not in themselves pose a health threat. And there we're going to consider them a lesser hazard when compared to contaminants. So we call these non-health hazards, sometimes referred to as low hazards. A good example would be food coloring. So it's not going to hurt you. It's fine to drink, but people do not want to be drinking red water. If they open their taps and their water is red, they're going to be unhappy. A contaminant or a health hazard is a substance which, when you introduce into the potable water system, is going to be a direct threat to the life or health of a human. And that's if that's 
through consumption, drinking water, cooking with it, or just through skin contact. So it can be a caustic chemical, a fluid containing bacteria or disease, or any other substance which can threaten human health. So these compose the highest degree of hazard to the potable water system. So we'll call these a health hazard or sometimes a high hazard. A good example would be fertilizer. There are lawn sprinkler systems with fertilizer injectors. That fertilizer will make you sick, and if it gets back into the potable water system, that's going to pose a direct risk to human health. So to continue with our criteria for backflow selection, we have four questions we can ask. What is the potential for back pressure? Back siphonage can always occur because you can always have a water main break, but there might not be any potential for back pressure. Is it a health hazard? What kind of health hazard? We just discussed this. Will the application require continuous pressure? So continuous pressure is typically defined as more than 12 hours of pressure in any 24 hour period. Something like your boiler feed line is always gonna be under pressure, but a hose bib or a faucet, something where you're only turning it on, you're only pressurizing it when you need to use it, will likely not. What is the orientation needed? There are often several options. We saw earlier you can have end pattern, horizontal and vertical, and that same double check. And of course, the ultimate answer is always check with the authority having jurisdiction for AHJ. They're giving you the water, they're going to be the ones who are going to be able to tell you, is something high hazard, is something low hazard, what do they require? That's not up to me, it's often not up to you. You have to consult with that water authority. So backflow is a heavily regulated environment. We as a manufacturer and you as a specifier, owner, installer need to know what to look for. I'm not gonna go through all of these in the interest of time, but I'll touch on a few. First one is that top one, ASSC, the American Society of Sanitary Engineering. It's one of the main governing bodies. When we go through, you'll notice there are a lot of different ASSC standards for different specific applications for backflow preventers. The other big certifying body is the University of Southern California Foundation for Cross-Connection Control and Hydraulic Research. I'll often just call it USC. They're one of the first institutions to really look into backflow prevention, and they are still one of the largest ones that certify testable backflow preventers, and many jurisdictions require their approval or ASSC's approval or both. UL or CUL and FM, they deal with insurance. They're typically only required on backflows and fire sprinkler systems. The other big one is NSF, the National Sanitation Foundation. They're used to certify that a valve is safe to use in drinking water, uh, in particular that it is lead free. So as you can see, there are several more, but I'm going to keep moving along in the interest of time. If you have any questions about them, feel free to submit that through the chat box. So one way of grouping backflow is into testable versus non-testable devices. You can see there are several of each kind. So why do we need to test specific ones, or why don't we have only testable? So it depends on a number of factors, including the type of hazard, likely failure modes, and the cost of the device. Testable is desirable because you can check functionality, but they're typically larger and more expensive, and that can be overkill. For example, many jurisdictions don't require residential containment backflow to be testable due to the cost of the homeowner, but will require testable backflow on commercial containment. So note, just typically North American building codes require testable devices to be tested when they are installed, repaired, and annually to ensure proper function. So let's start talking about actual backflow preventers. First device we'll talk about is an, a, an atmospheric vacuum breaker that is ASSE standard 1001. Uh, it's typically for isolation, so this is protecting hazards within a property, it's point of use, and protects from back siphonage only, but you can use it for health hazards. So how does it work? Notice this white float right here. When you get, you turn your water on, that water is going to cause that float to raise up and it's going to seal this atmospheric vent. This vent goes right outside to atmosphere. If you get a back siphonage condition, which is negative or sub-atmospheric pressure, it is going to suck that float back down and it's going to break the vacuum, hence a vacuum breaker. This way, 
it will siphon in air rather than potentially contaminated water. So you cannot use this for continuous pressure because of concerns that after time that vent float will get stuck up here in the up position if it's constantly there being pressed against the seat. Because of that, you cannot put any shutoffs downstream, and that's because they assume that you will use that shutoff to control flow, and you're gonna leave that device pressurized. It also has to be installed a minimum of six inches above the highest downstream water outlet, and that is because height is pressure. If you have a discharge point that's higher than the device, that's back pressure, because in a water column, every foot effectively creates about 0.4 PSI. They can also occasionally discharge water, but there are spill-resistant vacuum breakers available, like this one down on the bottom right. As far as applications go, these are pretty ubiquitous. They're in lawn sprinklers, parlor sinks, dishwashers, washing machines, process tanks. They really have a large variety of applications, as long as they can get installed above the highest outlet point downstream, and there's no potential for back pressure. Hose bib vacuum breakers, ASSC standard 1011. You may see these on your hose bibs outside your home, right where you connect your hose up to water your plants. Just like an atmospheric vacuum breaker, they are for isolation protection against back siphonage only, and they're appropriate for health hazards, which hoses are because you can connect them to just about anything, and they should not be subjected to continuous pressure. They do work a little bit differently than an atmospheric vacuum breaker. They have a diaphragm right here, this black piece, that under pressure and flow is pushed up, which seals this vent. And in back, siphon, back siphonage conditions, it will suck that diaphragm up and open that air vent and break that vacuum. So very similar, just works a little bit differently. Also because they're typically installed low to the ground and you can hold a hose up above your head, they do have a single check in there. And that's there to hold some light back pressure a 10-foot water column or about 4.3 PSI. These, despite being small, little, inexpensive devices, are extremely important because hoses are the number one unprotected cross-connection in America, and there are several case studies of water contamination and getting people sick through unprotected hose bits. ASSE 1024, these are dual check valves. A dual check is exactly what it sounds like. It's two check valves. You have check valve one, check valve two. So they allow water in one direction, but not the other. And it has two, so it has some built-in redundancy for safety. These are typically for residential containment, so you'll often see them right after a residential water meter. They are rated for back siphonage and back pressure, as well as continuous pressure, but they are not for health hazards. Down here, you can see they come in several styles and sizes, including chromed ones and hose connection ones. Uh, these are also extremely common. So we covered dual checks. Now we have dual checks with atmospheric vents. This is a sort of combination dual check and vacuum breaker. We're actually covering three different ASSE standards here. So we have ASSE 1012. That's this device in the lower right-hand corner. You have that cutaway right above it. These are for non-health hazard, but full back pressure and back siphonage, continuous pressure applications. The number one application for these, residential boiler feed lines. We also have two other fairly specific standards. We have ASSE 1052 with a hose connection back flow preventer that works very similarly to a hose bib vacuum breaker. That's this second valve from the right. You can see above it as a cutaway. This top half should look pretty familiar. It looks almost exactly like a hose bib vacuum breaker. It just has the additional check valve. We also have ASSE 1035. It's a laboratory faucet vacuum breaker. It's very similar in construction to the hose connection vented dual check with a higher temperature rating, a lab faucet connections, a couple small changes. So like hose bib vacuum breakers, ASSE 1052 and 1035 devices are rated for low back pressure, so that's 10 feet of head or 4.3 PSI, and should not be subjected to continuous pressure. So going on to more kind of highly specific application-specific backflow preventers, we have 
dual check and dual check with atmospheric vent uh, valves for carbonators. These are made specifically for carbonated beverage dispensers, just like your soda dispenser at a fast food restaurant. This is because when you mix carbon dioxide with water to make carbonated water to make soda, you also form carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid, if it gets back into the copper piping, it will leach that copper out of those pipes and potentially gives people copper poisoning. And there, there are several case studies where this exact situation has sent people to the hospital. So these are just like ASSE 1024, 1012 devices that we already went over. They're rated for back siphonage and back pressure. They're for non-health hazard use and they can withstand continuous pressure. The vented version, that ASSE 1022 device, can have occasional discharge. So you do have to take that into account when you're choosing where to place these and you can actually plumb up something to that discharge line, get it to a place where it's not gonna make a mess. The main difference is that these cannot be made from copper alloys. So instead of the brass or bronze you would typically see in a dual check or dual check with atmospheric vent, these particular examples are all stainless steel or plastic. Single check valves for automated fire sprinkler systems. We include these because they are relatively common, but they are not true backflow preventers. A single check is not a backflow preventer. Uh, these do come, sometimes come with a metered bypass. We'll talk about that later. And they're sometimes okayed by the water authority and fire inspector for sprinkler lines, but for the most part, these exist because they are grandfathered in at this point. I'm not gonna take too much time on these. Just be aware that they exist. They're okay in some places, uh, but they're being replaced more and more now with actual backflow preventers. So here's our first true testable backflow preventer, a pressure vacuum breaker. So like an atmospheric vacuum breaker, these are for back siphonage only. They are appropriate for health hazard applications and they must be installed above the highest outlet point. In this case, it's 12 inches above the highest outlet and they can occasionally discharge water. So the big difference here between these and atmospheric vacuum breakers is that they can handle continuous pressure and therefore you can have shutoffs downstream. They're allowed to have continuous pressure because they have a spring just up here in this cutaway. That's gonna force that float vent down at low pressure. So there's not that risk of the float getting stuck like in an atmospheric vacuum breaker. They also have a single check valve in there for just an added layer of protection. You most commonly find these on residential sprinkler systems. So they can have those shutoff valves downstream so you can have different zones for your sprinkler system. You'll find them installed right outside of people's homes. So a spill resistant vacuum breaker, so ASSE 1056. This operates largely the same way as a pressure vacuum breaker, but has a spill resistant feature that closes the vent prior to the check opening, allowing water to fill the device. This makes them appropriate for indoor use where that occasional discharge you'll get with a standard pressure vacuum breaker is more objectionable. You don't want water on the floor. So you'll find them in applications such as indoor chemical dispensers. They'll be mounted above the, the dispenser. That's for things maybe like soap dispensers or cleaning chemicals for mop sinks, stuff like that. Double check valve assemblies. So double checks are ASSE 1015 devices. And this is where we're gonna get into some of these larger devices as these are typically available anywhere from a half inch all the way up to 10 inch sizes. These are for containment or isolation. So that's point of source or point of use. They're for non-health hazard applications, but they can handle back pressure and back siphonage as well as continuous pressure. And they typically can be installed horizontally or vertically with the flow going up. Like the dual checks, these are essentially two single checks. Check one, your upstream check on the left-hand side. Check two, your downstream check on the right-hand side. The main difference is that they must be testable. You'll see on all of these examples down here, you have four test cocks on every single one. You have one upstream of the shutoff, downstream of the first shutoff. You have one that's just like this. It's going to be in the zone between the two checks and one that's going to be in the zone after the second check. So these are used 
to make sure that the device is functioning correctly. And there's a variety of different testing methodologies depending on where you are in the country. These are also not devices. You'll notice it says a double check valve assembly. So what that means is they must have shutoffs on either side. Sometimes you'll see people, they'll get the valve with the shutoffs. They want to be able to isolate more equipment. So they'll take one shutoff on, they'll throw in a strainer, or they'll throw in a pressure reducing valve, throw that other shutoff on. That is typically not code compliant. They come assembled with those shutoffs, those shutoffs should stay where they are. Both that first check and that second check, they require a minimum of a one PSI differential to open. So that's one of the things that they're testing for when they, when they hook up their differential pressure meters up to those devices. That means if I'm measuring that differential pressure across either of those checks, it should always be at least one PSI, whether water is flowing or not. So of course, the reason these are for non-health hazard is that the only time you know this device is functioning is when you are testing it. The very next day, next hour, next minute, after you leave and you okay this device, it's tested, it's functioning well, it could get debris in it, both checks could foul, and it can be render, rendered ineffective until it's tested again, failed, and then repaired. This is not very likely, but it is possible. So that's why it's a non-health hazard or rated for low hazards only. So what about those health hazard applications? Well, for those, we use a reduced pressure zone assembly. So other than an air gap, this affords the highest possible degree of protection. It's used for containment or isolation, back pressure and back siphonage, but it's rated for health hazard applications as well as that continuous pressure. The downside is that it will occasionally discharge water and in a catastrophic event, it can discharge quite a bit of water, a serious amount of water. It can cause some flooding. Uh, it also must be installed a minimum of 12 inches above grade and typically cannot be installed vertically. You'll notice it has test cocks and shutoffs, just like the double check. It's also an assembly. Uh, the inner workings of a reduced pressure zone assembly are a little complicated. I have some slides in just a couple minutes that's going to explain how they work. But first, I just want to touch on detector assemblies. So here we have a double check detector assembly. These are just like double checks, but they have a bypass to monitor unauthorized water usage or leaks. That's because these are typically used on fire sprinkler systems, which are unmetered connections. But the water authority wants to know if there are leaks or someone is stealing water because it's an unmetered connection and they're not paying for it. They work by putting a bypass around the device with a smaller device in the bypass with the same protection. So in this case, all these double checks have a device, have a bypass around the entire device, and they have a double check in the bypass. Otherwise, that bypass would be a cross connection. It'd, it'd represent a hazard. They detect water by biasing the springs to be a little stronger in that main device than in the bypass, so that first couple gallons a minute are going to flow through that smaller line and through that water meter. So these don't detect all of the water going through. It's not a full totalizing meter. It's just there to alert you that there's flow when there shouldn't be any flow, because unless your building's been on fire recently and the sprinkler systems have gone off, there shouldn't have any, been any flow through that device. Reduced pressure detector assemblies work the same way as that double check detector, but instead of a double check in the bypass, they have reduced pressure detector assembly in the bypass. There are such things as type two bypasses which only have a single check in the bypass because they only bypass a single check in the main assembly. These are out of the scope of this presentation. If you want to know anything more about it, I'd be happy to talk with you about it later. So just be aware that those do exist and they are approved. So how do reduced pressure detector assemblies work? So how do RPs work? RPs have a stronger first check than a DC. It's a five PSI differential check. So there should always be a minimum of a five PSI differential across that first check. It also has a differential pressure relief valve. That's this relief valve here on the bottom that is held by its open by that spring. So what's happening when in normal happy flow? So first, it's gonna hit that valve. It's gonna flow down here, it only requires two PSI, 
to close that vent, and then with five PSI, we'll open that check. Open the second check, you'll get flow. Because there should be a minimum of a five PSI differential across that first check, even with that two PSI spring biasing it open, you have three PSI holding it closed minimum all the time. So again, this spring, it's adding effectively two PSI to this zone. It's fighting against the incoming water pressure, but because of that five PSI drop, you have three PSI holding it closed. Everything's good. No one's complaining that there's water on their floor. So what happens when there actually is a leak? So the one main cause of failure is that fouled first check. So you have a piece of debris, it gets stuck, your demand ceases, and now that incoming water pressure is gonna travel over into that zone, and with that help of that two PSI spring, it's gonna open the valve. You're gonna get water on your floor. So the size of the debris will dictate the size of this leak. In this case, it's a pretty big piece of debris, it's a pretty big leak. It could be something as small as a little piece of Teflon tape, a grain of sand that will cause a small drip. Or if you have a large device and you get a large rock stuck in it, you can get in the order of tens all the way up to hundreds of gallons a minute, depending on the size of the device, the failure, the line pressure, all that stuff. So this serves two purposes. If indeed there is a backflow event occurring, both checks are fouled, you either have back pressure or back siphonage, you have contaminants downstream that are, you're risking getting into your potable water, it's gonna put those contaminants on the floor or on the ground rather than back in the potable water distribution system. It also serves a second purpose because if we remember double checks, you have no idea if a double check is working or not unless you just tested it. For an RP, it tells you if something is wrong. So it's giving a visual indication of failure. People don't like it when things are leaking, they're dripping, water's getting on their floor. They're gonna call someone, they're gonna get this fixed, they're gonna maintain that protection in their line. Of course, you can also foul your second check doesn't happen very frequently, but debris can manage to get by that first check and stuck in the second check. And then if you have back pressure, right, only if you have back pressure to increase the pressure in that zone between the checks, it will open that relief valve and you'll get water on the floor. So this is not all that common. 90 some odd percent of the time an RP is Failed, and failure isn't even really a good word. It's doing a job. If an RP is discharging water, it is something stuck in that first check. Let's just go through some other things, some common backflow accessories. I'm a huge proponent of strainers, especially for RPs. That's gonna help prevent some of that discharge. Not gonna catch those grains of sand, but it's gonna catch those big chunks that can result in a lot of water coming out of that relief valve. Do check with your water authority. They do not always allow these on the containment backflow because they want that backflow preventer to be the first thing after the meter. They also typically aren't allowed on fire systems, though there are ULFM approved strainers. Expansion tanks are useful to deal with thermal expansion since you create a closed loop with that backflow preventer. So if you have things heating up and cooling down, that can help with deal with some of those pressure fluctuations. Spools are there for retrofitting. Modern backflow preventers are a lot shorter than they used to be. So if you're retrofitting, you're, you're taking out an old, big, heavy, long, cast or ductile iron backflow preventer, you're replacing it with something newer, maybe, maybe stainless steel, you need something to make up that difference. And you have valve setters, which are used for end pattern backflow preventers when they're installed outside. That helps the underground guy. If you have any more questions about these, I'm gonna move along. Uh, but feel free to ask a question or shoot me an email. Troubleshooting. So really we're talking about RP since those are really the only ones that are gonna give you a visual indication of failure uh, other than maybe a vent float being stuck in a uh, atmospheric or pressure vacuum breaker. Number one thing, debris, scale, sediment, corrosion, stuff stuck in that check preventing it from closing. 
So first of all, your RP, it's discharging. It's doing its job. You want to figure out what's going wrong. If the discharge is occasional and random, it's probably fluctuating line pressure. That differential pressure relief valve doesn't care if you're raising pressure in that zone between the checks or if you've lost pressure in your upstream supply. It doesn't know the difference between the two. It's going to open up. So if you're getting it spits every once in a while, then it's a few hours and it spits and a few minutes and a few days, right? If you can't kind of time it, it's probably fluctuating supply pressure. But if it is constant, it's a timeable or it's a constant steady drip or steady flow, there's some good things you can do to try and figure out what's going on. That way, you, when you call a guy, he knows what kind of repair kit to bring if he needs to bring one. So step one, we're on this right-hand side. Shut down the outlet, shut off, watch the relief valve. If the relief valve closes, your number two check is faulty and you have back pressure. Right? If you're isolating the downstream portion of the system and it solves the problem, the problem was with the downstream portion of the system. You're getting back pressure and it's migrating through to where that relief valve can sense it through that second check. So if that doesn't work, you open the number four test cock, you cause some flow. You need to cause more flow than the leak. So if it's a drip, you need a stream. If it's a stream, you need a bigger stream. So if that stops, it's your number one check is faulty. What you're doing there is you're actually lifting that check off of the debris so it's actually operating normally. It's just that when it goes to close and it can't shut, that's when you get the discharge. That doesn't work. It's probably your relief valve. Your relief valve can get things stuck in it. It can get that debris or scale or sediment or corrosion, just like your checks. It is less common, but it does occasionally happen. Just some myths about repair. People complain, right? It takes too long, parts are expensive, you need too much training. Uh, assemblies these days, especially newer models, are all fairly easy to service. Some are better than others. I obviously have my own biases. Uh, but a good amount of the time, they just have some debris or buildup. You can take them apart, you can clean them relatively easily. They do often require some knowledge and experience. Uh, but also, there are plenty of videos online, and typically you need a license to be able to repair these. So a licensed repairman should be able to take any of the common backflow preventers and repair them fairly quickly, as long as there isn't something weird going on. We also get a lot of questions about warranties, especially on new installations of reduced pressure zone assemblies when they're discharging. The vast, vast majority of the time, this is not a manufacturing defect. The lines just weren't adequately flushed, and there's debris caught in that first check. We pulled all sorts of stuff out of these first checks, chunks of concrete, gloves, animals. Right? We did not ship that backflow with a two by four stuck in the first check. So before your customers say, hey, this thing's leaking, I'm pulling it out, I'm sending it back to the manufacturer, don't send it back to me, because if it's something in the line that caught in the first check, I can't do anything for you. So when that happens, don't remove the valve, have someone qualified open it up, and 99.9% .9 of the time, they're gonna find a rock or some other object that made it into the system uh, that's in there in the first check and the device is fine. So guys, in summary, I'm hoping now you understand the importance of a backflow preventer to the protection and conservation of safe drinking water. I hope you can describe the general uh, importance and aspects of cross-connection control programs. You understand something about the selection criteria and how they work. You understand the typical faults and failures and some of the typical troubleshooting and maintenance solutions. So now with that, Greg, I believe you've been collecting some questions from our attendees. Yes, thank you, Cameron. Uh, we had a few questions come through on the Q&A chat line. Uh, first one, do you have a table that will summarize the types of the devices with ASSE classification? We do somewhere. I will look that up and find it. Uh, Greg, if you could write down who asked that, or I will send it to you specifically, and I'll see if I can get that attached to a follow-up email. It's a great question, so just something with 
ASSC standard, what the device is, typical application. Okay. Uh, how can you tell if a dual check is fouled and no longer working correctly? That's a great question. You cannot. That's the big difference right there between that testable and non-testable backflow preventers. So your dual check as opposed to a double check, you have no idea if it's operating correctly unless you take it offline, open it up, see if there's stuff stuck in the checks. For that reason, typically those are recommended to be on regular replacement cycles, something like every five years you pull it out, you put a new one in regardless, they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, a lot of like rural water municipalities, they'll actually control that and when they go in and they do water meter change outs or repairs, they'll just replace that check along with it, that dual check. Okay, a few more came in here now. Is the downstream pressure always 10 PSI less due to the spring pressure requirements or does the pressure even out after a period of no flow? So the downstream pressure is always going to be less unless you have some sort of back pressure being generated in the system. So this is actually what people are testing for when they hook their test rigs up to these devices. You're going to have, in a dual check, a minimum of two PSI pressure loss. In reality, it's usually going to be more like five, right? We send these things out with the springs stronger than necessary because over time, they're going to get a little bit weaker, and we don't want that backflow preventer to fail uh, if it has that less than one PSI differential. So, yes, there should always be a pressure loss across that backflow device, regardless if it's been flowing or not. Do SVBs leak at all during backflow? Oh, the spill-resistant vacuum breakers. I'm not going to say that they're 100% never going to leak. Um, they are very, very unlikely to leak. Uh, the only possible thing, I mean, I'm sure there's a few different things that can happen. The main one is if you get something stuck in there somehow between the vent float and the seat. But in reality, if you have backflow, your air is going to be stuck into the, the device. It's not going to be spitting water. So it's very hard to get those things to leak. Uh, so typically, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Any recommendation resource for a specific backflow assembly types or specific equipment, i.e. commercial kitchen combination ovens, or yeah, combination ovens, commercial coffee makers, et cetera? Yeah, so I mean, these are typically go by IPC or UPC standards. Uh, we do have some tables, I mentioned them earlier, with just an ASSC standard up against typical applications. Ultimately, those are recommendations. It's up to your plumbing inspectors. Uh, ultimately, they're the authority, right, just like on your containment backflow, they're the authority on whether you need a double check or an RP or can you use a non-testable, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I do have something, I'll dig it up uh, and I'll see if I can send it out. Is there an overall inventory of items requiring backflow prevention? Oh, geez. So there's a lot of different kinds of cross connections. To be fair, a lot of things are built in, right, for flushometers. On your urinals, those have built-in backflow preventers, and so you're not going to have to put something specific in there. I would say there's probably no 100% complete comprehensive list just because of the multitude uh, of different potential cross-connections. Um, that's really what your plumbing inspectors, they might have, you might have specific guys who go out there just looking for all the potential cross connections, that's, that's what they're out there to do. Again, that, that same document I've been referencing will help, um, but it's really up to the code you're following and the people who are enforcing it. Why are fire sprinkler systems unmetered? Oh, fire sprinkler systems are unmetered because you shouldn't pay to put out a fire. So A, it's because putting out fires is a, a greater good. 
right? If I don't want to pay for water to put out a fire and my home burns down, I'm probably going to catch your house next to mine on fire. And B, it's just one more thing that's in the way of the water. Already a backflow preventer is in, is in there. We've determined that it's necessary. We want as few things obstructing flow between your water main and your sprinkler head where it can effectively put out that fire. So that's why they're unmetered connections, which is why they have those bypass meters just to look to see if there's any flow which shouldn't be happening. Okay. Are there best practices or recommendations for whether one or two RPZAs are needed for a high-rise building? If so, what would be the recommended split of use between two RPZAs? 50 over 50, 100 over 25, 100 over 100. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, so you don't need them in series, so I'm going to assume you mean in parallel. Usually, it's just about pressure drop. Someone's doing a hydraulic calculation to try and figure out whether or not uh, you're going to need two larger lines as opposed to one line, right? They're only certified up to 10 inches for the most part. There are some 12-inch devices out there. Uh, so if you need a 12 or 14 inch line, you're gonna to have to split it up and put it into two backflow preventers. The other side of that is sometimes you'll have, people will have two if you have something like a, like a high rise or a hospital or something where if it's leaking and you need to take it offline to repair, there's gonna be a lot of angry people or perhaps a dangerous situation, something like a hospital if you don't have any water. And then you might have either two entirely separate supplies or you'll just have two backflow preventers. You can have one shut off and use one, and then you can isolate one and use the other one while you repair it. Uh, but in general, the only reason you would have two other than just redundancy for repair is if just hydraulically you need two larger lines, you can't do it with, a, say, a 10-inch backflow preventer. And how do I find if a specific model is approved? It's a good question. So. Typically, all of these different approval agencies, they have websites. Some are easier to use than others. Uh, the main two that I talked about, right, ASSE uh, and University of Southern California, they're pretty easy. You can look up a specific model for USC. They have a web app. You can use it on your phone, or you can download a PDF of all the approved assemblies. And there you'll see you know, the manufacturer, the model approved, the sizes it's approved in, the shutoffs it's approved with. So not only does it have to have shutoffs, but it has to have approved shutoffs, right? You can't take one gate valve and just use a different one. Uh, and it's also going to have orientation. So is it approved vertical or is it just horizontal? Uh, so if you go right to the ASSE website or right to the USC at CHR website, uh, it should be pretty easy to navigate through there uh, and download those lists to make sure that you're using, installing, specifying an appropriate device. Why are the fire hydrants not on backflow prevention? What a great question. <laughs> I actually don't know the answer to that one. It's, it's possible that there's a backflow preventer within a fire truck. I'm going to have to ask some of my, some of my contacts in fire prevention about that. Um, I would say the likelihood of getting backflow through a fire hydrant is pretty low. The only thing you're going to be connecting it to is a hose, and unlike a residential hose where you're putting that in your pool or you're diluting chemicals, it's just being used for firefighting, so it's possible that they just decided that it's not. Uh, I will say that other times when you're using a fire hydrant, uh, for example, Construction sites. Construction sites, often they don't have water, but they need it, right? Guys got a drink, they need water available to wash down. They have a fire hydrant, they might connect to that, but they will be required or should be required to put a backflow preventer on there. Uh, so a few different manufacturers, they'll sell backflow preventers specifically with that inlet having a connection for a fire hydrant. Okay, I see a few of you asked about a recording of this webinar, and yes, it will be mailed to you. 
uh, in the upcoming days. Um, those are all the questions I have right now. Uh, Cameron, do you have anything else? No, I'm good. I just wanted to thank all of you for coming. Uh, back flow prevention is an extremely important part to us keeping our water safe. Uh, and in general, other than plumbing professionals, right, not a lot of people know about it. People think back flow prevention is just something that they have to buy and it's a pain because they got to pay to get them tested. But it's really a vital part of keeping our water clean, which is a, a huge luxury. It's not like this in all the parts of the world. So thank you guys so much. If you ever have any additional questions, you should have my contact information from the emails. Uh, give me a shout. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Cameron, and everyone who joined us today. Like I said, we'll be emailing you a link to the recording of this webinar, so keep an eye out for that. And that's all we got, so thanks again, and have a great day.